your offering, but if you give one time, that's fine. Uh, we are going, Pastor, uh, I think, had mentioned this. We're going to take up a, a second offering um, for we have some families in need in the church. Uh, Pastor, I think, had made mention of this. So if you didn't, I'm going to tell you that. So this is going to be our tithes and offering, um, normal, that goes to administration of the church. If you have one check and you're like, man, I'm just going to write one check. If you'll put in the memo, family in need, and the amount for that, that would be great. If you give online, that's great. But we have four families in need, and Pastor said this, family offering. There's four families within the church that are solid. They're faithful. They are just struggling right now, and they need some help. They don't know we're doing it. Uh, they don't know who the families are. The families that are getting it doesn't know it, but Pastor felt on his heart. He wants to be a, a, a giver, and he wants to bless the families that has been placed on his heart, and he's asking you to help him bless. He has sowed a seed already into that offering, and he believes that God will do a great thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, uh, we're going to pray over both. They're going to take up the offering, and then they're going to come right back. So if you have an a offering for the families in need, that's going to go in the second second offering, okay? Unless you write one check, put on a memo. We can't read your mind. If you give a thousand dollars, we appreciate it, and you want 500 to go here and 500 there, just let us know, and we will be good stewards for you, okay? So first offering, tithes and offering. I know it's a little confusing on two offerings, but we're going to do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you that you allowed us to give unto you. Thank you for the spirit, Father, of generosity in this church. Thank you, Father, for blessing us to give. We ask that you will bless this offering. Lord, bless the needs that it is going to. Father, not only the administration of the church and all the things that we can do here. Father, we are sowing seed, but also for the families in need. Lord, that we can be a blessing unto them. Father, we love one another and we love to help each other. In your name we pray. Amen. So they're going to come to you now for tithes and offering. While they do, I just have a quick, <coughs> there's a moment here. If I could have Melissa come up here with me. So Melissa, take this. It's Mark, but turn with me. I was saddened today as I read the Bible uh, this week. I was saddened. <coughs> kind of hurt my heart and uh, it's a little emotional, to tell you the truth, Melissa, that you won't be with me in heaven. And I know y'all think that's shocking. I mean, I do have proof. If you'll read Revelation chapter 8 right here, verse 1, just read it aloud. Just, I've got scripture to back it. Go ahead. I know where this is going. Read that, honey. <sighs> and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. There, there is going to be silence today in the Hawk household, apparently. It's scripture. You can't go against scripture. How many believe scripture? I <laughs> just, okay. Well, all right. Love you, love you, honey. All right. We're going to have the fellas come back up. Hurry, fellas. Uh, don't leave me up here by myself. Oh, they have nothing. Uh, they said they're going to dump what we had and bring back, and that did not go as smooth as we anticipated. Here we go. All right. Sorry. I know you're standing we, we appreciate you standing. Here they come now. This is our offering for our family, families in need, okay? Pastor wants to reach out and be a blessing. Take that. Uh, Y'all go ahead. Uh, uh, we want to, and if you need to come back, you make sure you come back. Thank you for your giving. Um, as we are blessed, like I said, these four families, there's four of them. They do not know who they are. They don't know that they're going to be receiving anything. We are going to just, we are just going to shower them with love and blessing. That's what we're going to do, okay? So you get a chance to shower love and blessing on somebody. Thank you so much as a church for your generous giving. We appreciate you and thank you for all you do. Um, we're going to go to the Lord here in worship and in praise. We just talked about, I thank God. We, th we thank God as we're doing. Now we're going to talk about an unstoppable God. Man, he can do great things. Amen? All right. Now, y'all don't get excited. You get Melissa up here dancing some more, and she'll be leading y'all around. All right?
for his presence this morning. Lord, we just love you today, God. We just ask that your spirit just pour out upon us, Father God. Help us to receive what you want us to receive today. Hallelujah. Oh, I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is the hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. All oh, my words.
it with no music and sing it with all your might. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Yes, you sound good. Because all that I have is your hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I've nothing else before it here. Step for a heart. 
this be our prayer today. Father, 
we clear out our agenda and our schedule today. Holy God. Father, there are those here today that, that have came not feeling the best. Father, they are they're sick in their body. They're tired. They're worn out from the things that I've worked with them this week. Father, we have needs here in the church. God, there are many things that will hinder us. There are many things that the devil will put into our path as a stumbling block. But today, we say no more. Today, right now, we're just singing this, just this, this word, I will make room for you, Father. Whatever you want to do. I don't have an agenda today. I don't have all the thoughts that I have. I need this, that, this, that, this. Father, I'm just going to make room. I just need a, a, a touch from you. As James came up, I, Father, he, he needed a touch. He said, I just need prayer. Father, will you allow us this moment? We're just going to tarry for a moment, Father, just to say that we'll make room for you. Holy God. Holy God. Father, as we cry out to you in prayer, I'll make room for you in my life. This week, I'll, I'll, I'll make room for you right now that will perpetuate through this week. Holy God, help us to receive you. Holy God, help us to worship you today. Mm. Oh, we'll make room, Father. We have nothing more important right now than making room for you. Holy God. Listen, we're going to end on this. As we sing this, I make room. Just lift your hand. Just let it be. Let it be your prayer. Holy God. You can stand. You can sit. I just have a moment with the Lord. Holy God. Holy God. Yes, Father. I think too often we get to a spot where, what's next? What time is it? Where are we going? Sometimes we we have to just stop our life, what we're doing, stop the busyness, just have a moment with the Lord. It's all we're doing. It's your moment. That's what's even great about it. It's your personal moment. As you're singing today that you'll make room for the Lord. It is you and the Lord. There's not a certain way. You can raise your hand. You can bow your head. You can, you can laugh. You can cry. You have a personal relationship with the Lord. Father, I thank you today that we have been able to come together today with you. With this congregation that we have been able to praise you, to worship you, to cry out to you, to call upon you when we need it. Father, we have needs and we know you're the need meter. 
Father, we have thoughts and things that the devil will attack us with, but we know that you're a protector. When he comes in like a flood, you will raise up a standard against him. He has tried to flood our minds and our lives with the junk that he creates, a chaos. But yet you have came in. You have been our rescue. I will be careful today to make room for you, not only in my life today, each and every day. It doesn't just stop while we're singing and praying. It doesn't just stop while we're in church. But as we go our way, we'll make room for you. When somebody wrongs us, we'll make room for you to show the love to them through us. When things don't go our way, we won't say life's not fair. We'll say, Father, you have a plan. Lord, I know things will happen. And I know we'll get, sometimes we'll just get a little disappointed. But God, we will call on you. And we'll make room for you today. Holy and righteous is your name, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you, Father. Lord, you are worthy of all things. Holy, holy God. God is a good God. Amen. He is wonderful and wonderful to be praised. Amen. I, I want to thank the Lord for his goodness in my life. I want to introduce or, or welcome, I guess, a couple of people here today. If you're, if you're new and you're here for the first time, if you're here for the first time, can you raise your hand? No? All right. No first timers? Good. Then you won't be, you know that I'm not normally up here this long, so I tell my joke and I leave, and that's my job. I know my job, I do my job. Uh, but today, without pastor here, um, I get the chance to minister but I want to welcome others. Good to have a uh, home, hometown boy with us today and Pastor Jerry Orsburn and his wife, Vicki. Good to have y'all with us today. Amen. <laughs> hometown. Always nice to have people come back home and visit. He, he was going to visit with Pastor, but he wanted to hear a real preacher. Come on now. <laughs> That's what we're telling him anyway. That's why he didn't say that, but he said that. Uh, and I, we had prayed earlier for Rose Hill. We're, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought I went like that. Did we not? No, you're doing good. I thought I went like that to you, and Abby didn't get my signal. Um, and also, we prayed earlier for the Rose Hill Church uh, because I had to close service. But that did not stop Pastor York from coming to be with us today. So thank you. Thank you for coming, and uh, we want to remember as we we're praying for them, they've got some uh, illnesses and sickness going through the church, so let's continue in, in praying for, for them and the church, praying for strength and encouragement and healing, amen, and growth and financial blessing. I'll just keep adding, amen, amen. Um, hey, just so you know, uh, we are going to, we, I, I've got a note, so this is we. We are going to have index cards, and on these index cards, we need your info. We are trying to make a church directory, so if you could put your name, uh, you know, phone number, email, social security number, visa card. Just kidding. Don't don't put all that. Don't don't. You can put that. We'll use it. Thank you for your giving. But uh, Melissa is, has some index cards, and she'll do that. So if you if you get an index card or Oh, there she is. So she's back there. Um, they are blank, correct? So we just need your name and your telephone number, address, email, and if, birthday. And if you're married, give us your anniversary, okay? That way we can help and we may want to send you something, like an envelope for you to give more. I'm kidding. We want to send a card. We want to send a card to you that says happy birthday or happy anniversary. We used to sing happy anniversary to you, oh, happy anniversary, and may you find Jesus. Okay, we quit singing that. That's a good reason. All right, so we might sing. How many had a birthday this past week? Anybody? Oh, Michael Jordan did. Sure did. Amen. Who else? Somebody else? Oh, James had a birthday. All right. We, don't have, we used to have a birthday chest trunk up here. You could come get a prize. We don't do that anymore. We give you no prize. You get nothing. 
Except happy birthday to you. We should do that. Welcome, welcome, and then also happy birthday. I was stalling. We're ready now. Amen. So you see an index card. Melissa will have that. We're going to get your information. We're not nosy. We're not going to stalk you. We just want to be able to reach out. If we have some change or something, we may send you a, a card or email, get on an email list, and you can unsubscribe should you like. Amen. Today, I want to preach to you. I'm very excited to preach to you. I am always get excited. I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control, and I just... I'm about to. Mm. <laughs> Today, t- if I had to title this lesson, pastor's not here, so usually when he's here and I preach, I have to keep calm because I see him, and, you know, sometimes you get into those eyes like, what are you doing? He's not here, so it's free for all today. <laughs> free for all. <laughs> Woo. Let's calm down. It's early. I'm going to get you all out of here early. That's good. Melissa, can I just go ahead and pass those out, Melissa, apparently? Oh, no, she just sitting down. Okay. Um, if I had to title the message today, it would be, Don't Blame God for the Storm. Mm, mm. Y'all going to say amen, and in a minute, y'all going to say, Oh, me, why is he talking about me? And I'm sorry. Here's why I'm going to talk to you and about you. Because the Lord's been talking about me, to me, and about me for the last two weeks, and I'm sick of it just plumb sick of suffering by myself and be like, Lord, I am blaming you for it. Why you put this storm in my life? Why'd you put this stumbling block? Why, why, why? And I'm telling you, he hit me with something and I was, I quit asking. I quit asking why because it made me mad, like righteously indignant, you might say. I was just mad that he, he answered in a way I didn't want him to. So I had to put a comma on my title uh, don't blame God for the storm. That's the title, comma. It's saving you. How could a storm save you? Glad you asked. Thank you. That was a rhetorical question, but I am glad you asked because I'm going to answer that. I want to tell you a little story. Perhaps you've heard it, perhaps not. Some of you have heard it, I'm sure. And if you have not, I cannot assume that everybody knows the Bible. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background. This is a story, simple story about Jonah. Oh, I've heard that before. Melissa's already walking out. She's heard it preached before. You have heard the story of Jonah preached, but there's a point in here that the Lord, I have been ministering for a lot, a lot, a long, long time, a lot of years, and all of a sudden he hit me, and I thought, hmm, he, there's a new Bible. <coughs> it was just produced to me that this scripture wasn't in there before, but I've read the story of Jonah again, and I saw this scripture, and I thought, hmm, I missed it. But let me tell you the story. I don't, I'm not intrigued with Jonah and the great fish, and we say it's a well. Well, actually, the Bible doesn't say it's a well. It's just a great fish. Well, I do know that, but it's a subspecies of a well. Actually, the species, I don't care. It was a great fish, number one. Number two, Jonah, we like, like to look at him as being this prophet and this man of God. Now, How many of you have ever read in the Old Testament and realized all the patriarchs of God, they didn't have it all together? (laughs) Whoo, David, man after God's own heart. I mean, read the Bible. That guy, he had some issues, right? You have issues and I have issues. Well, God, don't talk to me anymore. I have too many issues. If he can bless those guys that we read about, Listen, if you want me to put your life story on the screen and play it for everybody and see if you're worthy for God, none of us wants that. However, God wants to move in your life. So the thought about Jonah, let me point out a few things instead of just giving you the traditional story. First of all, he wasn't the most trusted prophet at the time. Jonah wasn't, even though he's got a book uh, written about him, because there was a story with King Jeroboam II, I believe. He was calling on... In 2 Kings, it tells this story. He's calling on all the prophets. He says, hey, can I go before and can I win this battle? And all the prophets said yes. And even Jonah was one of those prophets. But then they went to this other prophet, Micaiah. Hey. <laughs> uh, they went to him and they said, hey, this is what you're supposed to say. And he said, I will not. I will not say what you want. I will say what the Lord wants me to only We don't preach that story, do we? Jonah's got a book about him, but 
McConaughey, he, he, he doesn't have a book about him. I'll get that name by the, you know, you see me after church, I'll get it down for you. So <coughs> he went to him, he said, no, you're not, do not go. You can go. And he was sarcastic, so now he's my friend. He said, you can go, but you're going to lose. Do not go. And so sure enough, they didn't. The point of that is, is sometimes you think, oh, I can only do this, I can only do that. Oh, this one's following me or that one. We get so tied up in our connections. We have Social media, I mean, don't get me wrong, I am an influencer on, on Instagram. <laughs> I have well over 100 followers. Okay, so I want to put K, 100K, I'm trying to reach, trying to reach 200, y'all. Give me a shout out, the Hawks. All right, um, he wasn't the most trusted prophet. Second of all, he wasn't the most loving guy. Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. Second commandment is like this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Jonah did not always subscribe to that mantra. Why? Why would I preach about Jonah? Well, when I get to heaven and say, sorry, Jonah, I had to pull out your faults. And he's like, yeah, I've been preaching about you in heaven with all the things you're doing. Thanks. See, that's how we work. So he... Uh, he wasn't the most loving. He hated the people of Nineveh. Hated them. Hate. Not like, yeah, I don't really care for it. Not like, oh, they're a rival. No, I wish they were dead. So much so that he didn't want to go because he knew God would save them. He's like, no, I'd do anything but go to Nineveh. Because if I go and say one word, in Hebrew, he preached a message, five words in Hebrew, according to the language, and they turned their lives around and all got saved. The king, the people, the cows, the Bible says the cows. Isn't that amazing? Y'all got to read the book of Jonah. I'm telling you, I'd like to preach it all, but I don't have time. We're going to talk about it. You ever seen a saved cow? <laughs> Produces whipped milk. I'm just kidding. Not as a scream. Whipped. It's already whipped. That just made that up. I just, that's not right. That's not scientifically right. That's not. <laughs> anyway, he, d he didn't like Ninevehites. Hated them, right? Hated them. Y'all got me? Wasn't the most loving guy. And you know what? He, even, he, he was justified in some of his hatred for the people in Nineveh, and I'll tell you why. Isaiah chapter 36. I'm going to read some scripture to you. I'm going to use a new uh, living translation. So if you don't have that Bible, it'll be up here. Uh, if you have that, King James, then there you go. Who's got that? Oh, it's blinking. Distracting. All right. Isaiah chapter 36, verse 1. In the 14th year of the King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib, got that name right, Sennacherib of Assyria came to attack the fortified towns of Judah and conquered them. King Sennacherib, right? Y'all, anybody pregnant looking for a boy's name? There you go. Hey, Sennacherib. We call him Naki. Ribby? No. How would you shorten that? Sennacherib. That's what my mind thinks. All right. So we know King Sennacherib of Assyria was there. They attacked the fortified towns of Judah, and they conquered them. Okay, stay with me. Verse number 18 through 20. Don't let Hezekiah mislead you. Now, this was uh, the servant of uh, Sennacherib, his, his chief, he went to him. He was going to destroy the, the country again. And he said, don't let Hezekiah miss you, mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any other nations ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? Verse 19, what happened to the gods of Hama and Arpad? And what about the gods of Sepharim? Did any God rescue Samaria from my power? Hmm. Verse 20. What God of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? This is uh, Sennacherib, King Sennacherib. This is his, his, his chief of staff saying and telling the words like, tell the people. They won't be saved. If I want to conquer them, I will conquer them. I will wipe them out. Now, if we go to Isaiah chapter 37 and verses 36 through 37, what we have here is that didn't happen. 
In fact, the Lord stood up against them. And it said in verse 36, that night the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. And verse 37, then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. He went to home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. So I'm just letting you know, Sennacherib was an evil king that destroyed everything that wasn't his, and he based out of Nineveh. So Jonah, being a, a, a Jew, being a Hebrew, knew that this king was evil, and the people around, anytime they had, was evil. So he had a justification for his hatred for these people. Makes sense to me. If you're going to kill everybody in my family, I'm no longer going to invite you to the wedding. Right? Hmm. So anytime you see me, you're going to kill me and destroy everything I have. Hey, you want to go to brunch? It doesn't happen that way, right? So he was justified in that. You think, well, I get it. I get it. Ugh. Bible says that we should pray for those. We should bless them. We should love them. Who should we pray for, love, and bless? Those that persecute us? Mm. Those that would talk about us, that would put us down? Oh. When somebody wrongs you, bam, turn the other cheek. How many times should you forgive? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. Whew. Oh. How many cheeks I got? How many times I got to forgive them? Didn't, how many times have you messed up and said, oh, Jesus? I'm sorry. We do have video of your life. Who, who's raised your hand? How many times have you said, Jesus, forgive me, and he has? Yet we won't forgive our, our brother because he wronged me. How did he wrong me? He cut me off in traffic. Hope he gets a ticket. How many of you have ever been cut off in traffic? just so mad and you go up and the police has them pulled over anybody happen to how many of you get extreme joy when that happens <laughs> y'all need salvation <laughs> don't get me wrong it's normal but you need salvation we have when somebody will wrong us in what way Oh, they didn't talk to me. They didn't shake my hand or they they messed up a deal. It's like giving um, money to family members. It's never a loan. It's a gift. The moment you get that in your mind, you will have forgiveness a lot easier. Hey, can you loan me money? Take it. Don't come back. Just don't don't try to pay it back. It ain't, it's not going to happen. Here's my gift to you. I'll pay you back. No, just take it. Why? We get so offended on every little thing. Anybody? Anybody offended? Anybody? Anybody? No? Okay. So Jonah was offended. Probably rightfully so, but he hasn't had the best track record. Anyway, let's continue on. Jonah, chapter, book of Jonah, chapter 1, he disobeyed God. I want to point out five things to you in these scriptures, and then we'll end the day. Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Verse 2. What did he say? Get up, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> anyway, that was pretty good, wasn't it? I just threw that. Come on, Melissa. What did he tell Jonah? He said, Get up. He said, get up and go. How many of you like when the Lord talks to you? Anybody? Oh, it's nice. When I'm, when I'm praying and the Lord says, my son, well done now, good and faithful servant. Peace be unto you. We like that. But when the Lord says, uh, excuse me, knucklehead, Why? We don't like that. God never talks to me anymore. Oh, he talks. You don't listen. Miracle ear done turned off. Batteries must be dead. What? No, I'm telling you, he said, get up and go. He gave him a commandment. Get up and go. 
We should listen to get up and go. And what should we do when the Lord tells us to get up and go? We should get up and go. Where is he telling us to go? I don't know, but I'm going to go. Mm. Get up and go, comma, semicolon. Pause there for dramatic reading. Where? I don't care. Get up and go. We should get up. He should have done got up and went. Instead, Jonah, listen, to get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. You lost me there. Get up and go, Melissa. Get up and go to that person who has offended you and go apologize. But I didn't do anything wrong. Mm. Get up and go and help that minister or that, that family out. We took an offering today. We already took it, so I'm not taking another one. But if you get convicted and want to give, we still have the offering back there. Get up and go. Give to a family in need. I placed something on your heart, and you didn't give it. There's still a chance. When you go, just go back there and say, hey, Lord told me he, he hit me. Uh, I was going to give earlier, but the guys were so fast, I didn't get a chance or whatever you want to do. Just get up and go. But until we know where we're going to, we want to question everything. Get up and go. Where? Nineveh, not going to do it. Why? Uh, they're evil, evil people. I don't want to go. Jonah had a reason. He said, if I talk to them, they're going to give their heart to the Lord, and I don't want them to be saved. Why? I want them to be dead. That's, that's what Jonah wanted. He didn't want Nineveh to be saved. I, I don't know if y'all ever thought this part was in the Bible, but it's, it's there. I'm reading to you. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Look at verse number three. But <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, get up and go. But Jonah got up and went. Went is opposite of this direction is opposite of go. Get up and go. No, he got up. So get up and went would have been good. But it said get up and went in the opposite direction. Now, I know you know the story of Jonah and he got swallowed by a whale. Oh, Jonah got swallowed by a whale. It was old fish tail. He got swallowed, lived in there. Jonah got swallowed by a whale. Just made that up. That's a pretty good song. That's me freestyling. That's pretty good. <coughs> I almost said, who <laughs> built the ark? Jonah, Jonah. He didn't build the ark. That's another story. Get up and go. Verse number three, Jonah got up and went the opposite direction. Mm. To get away from the Lord. Mm. I just need, I do need to pause here because I think sometimes we... Let me, I, I tell you, I've been dealing with this. Uh, I've been dealing with this for a while. I, I've tried to, to blame the Lord for the storm. Obviously, I'm righteous and holy and do everything right, so how could the Lord place anything on me? Well, why would the Lord let good thing or bad things happen to good people? Well, let me answer a few questions for you. Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction, to get away from the Lord, he went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship living, leaving for Tarshish. And it says here that he bought, he bought a ticket. So now he's going in the wrong direction. He's using his own money. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Okay, so now let's get to the good part. All right, what's the good part? The thing that you blame for causing you trouble may be the actual thing that is keeping you in the right direction. Verse number four. <coughs> but, what does it mean when you say the word, but it means that you can forget anything that happens beforehand? <coughs> Melissa, you look good, but. I mean, I would never say that. I, I mean, I'm some dumb, I'm not plum dumb, just so you know. But I'm saying if I was to say that, she would be like, well, I don't really look good. No, you look good. You look good all the time. All the time. Whew. I never get nervous. But <laughs> The thing that you blame for causing you trouble may be the actual thing that is keeping you in the right direction. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind 
over the sea. Look at that next word. Causing. Causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Wait just a minute. Wherever I'm at, the Lord will protect me. He will guide me. He will rescue you. Rescue me. But the Bible says here in Jonah that the Lord caused a storm, a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. To just, what happens if you break the ship apart? You go in the sea and you could drown. They could destroy everybody. The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm. And you wonder sometimes why you're going through a storm. Instead of saying, Lord, why am I suffering? Lord, why am I going through this storm? Lord, why is this always happening on me? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Whoa! Instead of saying that, all you hee-haw fans, some of you are like, what? Hee-haw, check it out. Uh, instead of wondering, perhaps we should know the storm may be keeping us in the right direction. The storm may be the only thing that actually is holding us together because it's in the midst of the storm when you start getting things together. Nobody knows where the flashlight is until the tornado siren goes off. Nobody checks the cellar for the snakes and the spiders until it starts raining. Well, I'm not going down there. There's spiders. Yeah, because a tornado will certainly be better than a spider. Well, there's cobwebs down there. Is there a light down there? There's no electricity. Can't find a flashlight. Why? We're not prepared. We didn't prepare. Oh, uh, David Lane? No. Payne? David Payne said there's a storm coming. He prophesied to you. There's a storm coming. Mike Morgan said, get ready, get ready, get ready. There's a storm coming. We're like, he doesn't know. There's a little bit of rain. <laughs> Where'd my house go? Well, that rain was. The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm. He caused it himself. Why did he cause it? Because he was trying to get a hold of Jonah to do the right thing. He had something much bigger in mind than what Jonah's thought was. Jonah said, I don't like the people in Nineveh. He said, I don't care. There's hundreds of thousands of people there. Did they do you wrong? Yes. Who cares? They need salvation. How many of you here today would say, I hate that person so much that I hope that they never receive salvation and they spend an eternity in hell? If we don't believe that, then we cannot get on board with Jonah. He didn't care anything about him. So he went the other way now. Jonah made up for himself, but even as he made up for himself, if you read the scripture, he was still mad that God did it. Then he pouted behind underneath a tree, and then God caused a tree to die, and then he got mad about that. I'm telling you, Jonah might be a good guy, but he did not have a very good moment. And there's times in your lives when you may not have a good moment. You may be struggling and suffering and being like, I don't know why these storms are happening to me. Did God tell you to do something? So now you're saying it's my fault. Why are you blaming God for the storm? I would love to not preach this, but since my toes are hurting, I need somebody to get on board with me and say, hmm, perhaps it's me. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, oh, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Sometimes I have to realize I'm going through a storm that I caused. Why did I cause it? The only thing that got Jonah back on track was a storm. The only thing that saved the great city of Nineveh. The Bible says it took three days to walk through it. He started preaching and proclaiming for three days. That's how big the city was. In order to save all those people, it took a storm. So the storm you're going through may be what's saving you to help save others. Yeah. We don't want to look at a storm. We're like, ah, it's all, it's all a rose bush. It's all a rose. All ro smells good. Uh, let me just tell you what my old friend used to sing. Every rose has a storm. Come on now. Uh, no? No? Two, nobody knows. All right, some of y'all, <laughs> whatever y'all do. 
I don't know y'all rockers. I was never a rocker. I was a rap guy. Come on now, me and Kansas Station, that home away from home in the Black Benz limo with the cellular phone. We're call Come on now, that's me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's the, we're not doing it. <laughs> Posse's on Broadway. Come on now. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> Donnie boy knows word to your mother. All right, here we go. It caused a violent storm. Jonah was so set. Now nah, I digress. Jonah was so set on his way that he would have rather the sailors kill him, the sailors kill him, instead of do what God commanded. Because in the scripture, I'm not reading. You can read uh, in the book of Jonah, chapter uh, in verse one, uh, chapter one, as it goes through. He says, "What's happening?" And they're like, yeah, it's a storm. He says, I, I believe in the God who created the land and the sea, and he's mad at me. And so you shouldn't look at something. And they threw lots, and it was him. They're like, we don't want to throw you over. He's like, yeah, y'all should just throw me over. I'd rather die than the people at Nineveh get saved. Are you kidding me? That's what he said. Just throw me over. I don't want to go to Nineveh. Wow. How many of you are facing a storm, and you still are? Are just you got your your heels dug in and you got clamps and like I will not be taken away from my hatred and we can't let stuff go because we have got it's like a you know you ever seen a, a, a ice climber they have those the picks and then they have the the shoes and they get in it and they and they like that and I'm below I'm going oh thanks. Oh, I've got tea. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I don't do that. It'd be dirty. Anyway, you just, and it just grabs a hold. And you think, oh, that's how we do sometimes with the things the Lord wants us to get away. Hey, that pettiness you got, you need to let go. Not me, Lord. I'm digging in. Get up, get up. Dig in, dig in, dig in. Oh, I'm going to dig in. Right? We dig in further. Hey, get. Get rid of that nonsense that's in your life. Nope, not me. Not, I'll get rid of other stuff, but I'm not getting rid of that. That's my secret. That's my pet. That's my pet. We get down to the altar, and we, we throw away the, the, we get rid of the, the mice, right? Perhaps a little gopher. And then we pick, we get up, and we pick the elephant up. <laughs> Y'all didn't know that was coming, did you? Just made that up, not even in my notes. So we, we do away with the small stuff. Then we'd pick up. We're like, oh, I'm just suffering for the Lord. It's your own fault. Get rid of the elephant. Well, I can't. I'm suffering. Lay it down at the altar. Can't. Can't. Why? I dug in. It's got a hold of me. It's got a hold of me. I, I don't want to let it go. Let it go, right? Just get rid of it. We don't want to do that. Why? We are so ingrained with thinking this is my life. This is my identity. That, that elephant on me is my identity. So now you identify with something that's wrong in your life. Well, I don't want to, but that's what I'm known for. I, I, excuse me, I tend to fly off the handle easily. It's just my nature. I'm, I'm redheaded. I'm Irish. You know, it's in my DNA. No, that's not who you are. That's who you have identified yourself with. I just use that because sometimes people say, oh, they're fiery. They have red hair. I'm not, I, I associate red hair with fire, I guess, but I'm not sure that's what it's supposed to be. Oh, I'm Irish. I just fly off and not, no disrespect to Irish. I've heard that all my life. Oh, you know, it's the Irish blood in me. Oh, is it? I'm more of like Lucky Charms Irish. Like, oh, someone's oh, it's after me, Lucky Charms. I'm like that guy more than the be that Irish. I mean, if you got any Irish in here, just uh, celebrate your Irishness. Um, I'm just saying, the Lord caused the storm. This is the only thing that helped Jonah get to where he needed to go. He wanted the sellers to kill him, and they're like, no. Imagine the intense focus that he had on not going. He was so intense on that focus that he would rather die than go to Nineveh. Imagine had... It's admirable, but it's misplaced. Imagine if he would have focused that then on doing the work of the Lord. So in verse number 17, it's not always the way you thought, but it is the right way. Verse number 17, the end of the chapter says, Now the Lord had arranged. 
So we got in verse 4, the Lord hurled powerful wind, causing a violent storm. Just because you're in a storm don't mean that you're all alone. Because in chapter 4, what the Lord started, in ch- in, I mean, verse 4 and what the Lord started in verse 17, the story of our life. But the Lord arranged, arranged a way out, an escape. Just kill me now. Just throw me overboard. Well, if we throw you overboard, you're going to die. He said, it don't matter. I'd rather die than go to Nineveh. Just throw me overboard. You know good and well when he got thrown overboard, he thought, that's it. I don't have to talk to them Ninevites anymore. Woo! But the Lord arranged. <laughs> Nemo, go get your brother. <laughs> what? Shark bait. Ooh ha ha. <laughs> what? What do you want? I want you to go pick up my friend. Who's your friend? Jonah. Oh, okay, go pick him up. Where is he? You'll see him. He's the only one swimming by himself in the storm. <laughs> so the Bible says, the, you don't read the Bible the way I read the Bible, because think about being in my mind. This is, whew, I spent like three days on this one scripture. Uh, arranged for a great fish to swallow him up. Arranged it. Can you imagine the arranging and the power and being like, you talk about having trained animals like, whoo, roll over jump, oh, speak, and we're like, oh, good. (laughs) He had a great fish. He's like, pick him up. That was the first Uber. (laughs) I just, (laughs) don't even get me started. That just hit me, too. uh, Anyway, Uh, he's like, go pick him up. (laughs) He he said, oh, when's he coming when he throws over? He threw him over, and the Bible says he arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days, and three nights. So uh, it came to pick him up, and that's what happened. Uh, the Lord arranged. Can you believe that? I mean, I know we've read the story, but let's just let's focus on it. The Lord, anyway, he arranged. He caused a storm, but he arranged a way out. How many of you have been through a storm lately and thinking there's no way to get out? I'm telling you, the Lord has already arranged a way for you to go out. But we get so focused in the storm, we can't see his arrangement. And unfortunately, his arrangement is not what we thought it would be. I guarantee Jonah didn't say, hey, throw me over. Uh, A fish will pick me up. Guaranteed he didn't think that. I mean, let's just be honest. Hey, I'm at, no, no, not here. The school of fish is up there. Let's go up there. No, he said, throw me over. It's fine. And a fish picked him up. God arranged. He don't just leave you out there. Can we understand the complexity that God thought of just to get Jonah back? You know what God could have done? He could have come and said, oh, you're going to think? Okay, turn. let me just go ahead and stop the storm. You can turn around. He didn't even inconvenience the other sailors much. Oh, yeah, there's a storm. Don't get me wrong. But he didn't say, hey, take him back. He's like, no, no, no. No need to inconvenience you. See, the problem is with Jonah and with us, we think we're going through a storm. Everybody else should be inconvenienced. Oh, my goodness. I just preached right there. I got goosebumps right there. We think everybody else should be inconvenienced over our storm. Woo. If I was one of them preachers, I'd be like, yeah. people don't have to be inconvenienced just because you're going through the storm. They can still pray for you. Don't be mad at me because I'm not going through a storm when you are. Because when I'm going through the storm, I look around and I don't see you. But when you go through a storm, you look around and say, where are you? I, I, that's how I spoke for y'all's pastor right there. That's how he feels sometimes. I'm sure he didn't tell me that, but I, pastor has to hear all your storms, right? And he wants to. Why? Because he loves you, loves you so much. He will listen to your storm. He'll pray for your storm. He'll help you get out of the storm. All the while, the storm is brewing all in his life, in his house, and not once do we go to him and say, hey, pastor, I got a need, I got a need, I got a need, I got a need. 
Are you doing okay? No, it doesn't matter. I got a need. I got a need. I got a need. I got some pastors in the house maybe say, yeah, that's right, but I'm not going to say it because I still want to keep my congregation. I'm not a pastor, so I don't have a congregation I have to keep. I get to come in, blow up, and blow out. And I'm just telling you, as a pastor, sometimes we get that, get that, get that, but there is a storm brewing in our own lives. We don't want to be inconvenienced. He, the Lord didn't inconvenience the sailors. He had Jonah. He's like, no, no, no. I've arranged for you to get back there. So he did. So the Bible says that he arranged it. The reason why I tell you it was the first Uber, which that's good. I'm going to write down my notes. I didn't have that. But Jonah chapter 2, verse number 10. Then the Lord what? Ordered. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. So God said, Jonah, get up and go. Jonah got up and went in the wrong direction. I'll show you, Lord. Will you? Okay. Then verse 4, the Bible says that the Lord caused a, or hurled a powerful wind, causing a violent storm. He's in the middle of the storm. But the Lord arranged in verse 17. He arranged transportation. And in verse 10 of Jonah chapter 2, he fulfilled that arrangement, had him safely on shore. Now, I can imagine Jonah coming out of there, the acid and the fish belly and the seaweed, and he's probably disgusting, and, you know, fish and visitors both stink after three days. He was in there three days and three nights. I bet he stunk. I bet he was nasty. Spit him up on to the beach, though. There you go. There you go. He didn't even have to swim. He didn't go up Imagine a great fish can only get so close to the beach. The Bible says spit him up on the beach. Now, he hurled him away, not to hurt him, but he got there so close, got him right there. Jonah just stepped out and said, well, guess I go. Why? Why, why is he still so adamant? Because he knows what God's going to do. If we know that God's going to minister and bless us, why? Jonah needed something in his heart long before the fish. Sometimes we overlook everything that's happening in our life because we have so much going on, on in our life that we can't put it together and know that we need God. I'm just telling you, there, there is a, a, a saying that goes around, does not go around enough, and that's you need Jesus. I mean, sometimes in your life you just need Jesus. Like, I see some of the things that people do, and I'm like, they need Jesus. If they had Jesus, they wouldn't do it, right? Wouldn't do it. So then we see that the Lord ordered the fish. So caused the storm, arranged for transportation, delivered him safely. Pretty good story, right? Pretty good. You have a storm in your life. Don't think it's an end-all, be-all. Well, this is a storm. Uh, Levi was telling my son, Levi was telling us the other day, they, he met a, a young man who's from Minnesota, and they met him uh, gaming online. He just met somehow, and Levi went to visit his friend in Texas, and this guy, they had been talking, this guy, young guy, just shows up and says, hey, I'm, I'm heading in. I want to get away from my home, and I, I come down, and so he spent some time with them, and it was just a, a good meet. He said, we really didn't know him. We were friends online, but got to meet. We became friends, all that, and just this uh, past week, uh, he found out that he took his life. And that hit me. And I'll tell you this. Nothing irritates me more than for someone to think they have lost all hope that that is the only way. I'm just going to tell you, and you will not convince me any other way, that there is nothing in your life, nothing, nothing that the devil can put in front of you, no lie he can give you that is worth you destroying what God has created. God created you. He created you who you are. You can say, oh, well, I don't know if I'm much. You are mighty in God. The, the girls went to Impact on the back of their shirt. They had, I am chosen. I am pretty. I am talented. I am all these things. In the bottom, it said enough. I am pretty enough. I'm talented enough. I'm, I'm whatever. I'm loved enough. All of those things, and that is so true. We've got to showcase that love to other people. 
so that people don't think the only way out is a way that, that has destroyed the creation that God has made. Right. It's sad me. Here's a young man. I, I never met him. But it hit Levi in the fact that he's like, man, this, I thought everything was fine. I didn't know anything was wrong. But yet he was facing so much turmoil in his life that he decided that was the way. I'm telling you, the devil is a liar. He does not have control over us. If we, if we will call upon the Lord, he will save us. Even in the midst of the storm, a storm that Jonah didn't want, but yet turned him around. Got him in a fish that he didn't want to go. You, go. you know good and well, Jonah says, well, I'll go back only if you give me a way. God provided a way. It wasn't the way that Jonah wanted. So now Jonah's mad about being in a fish. He was mad about the storm. He's mad about going to Nineveh, mad about the storm, mad about the fish. He got spit up on the beach. He still did what God wanted him to do. He didn't do it with the right heart. And so we see in our life, we do all these things, and we're wondering, well, I don't know why God's not moving in my life. I'm telling you why God's not moving in your life. You're not living for God right. I told you when I said, don't blame the storm, and we said, amen, later you're going to say, oh, me, because I've said, oh, me, a lot. I was like, God, I don't understand why I'm in this storm. Tornado came, hurricane, hail storm, hit it. Wind came, blew stuff down all in my life, and I'm like, Lord, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Then I started looking. I'm like, hmm, sometimes it's the storm that has led me in the right direction. Because it's when the storm has happened. Come on now. When the storm has happened, that's when I finally decided to say, oh, okay, what, Lord? What, what, what are you trying to say? I, Because I have to fall on my knees and call on him when I was just moving along. <laughs> zippity doo da, zippity yay. My oh my, what a wonderful day. I'm just moving along. Like Lord's like, hey, I'd like to talk to you. No need, God, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, but I'd like to give you a few things. Right now, I'm doing good, God. Yeah, but I'd like to showcase some things to you. Ah, I'm okay. It's when that storm came, I said, oh, Lord, did I lose you? No, you didn't lose me. I needed your attention. I have a great work for you. You might think, well, God doesn't do that. I'm sorry. What story did I just read you? God doesn't do that to his people. I can't help you. If you're, if you're in that, I can't help you. Listen, I don't say that he just sends a storm by your way every time. I don't say that. And I don't say that what you're going through is not that the devil's trying to, the devil may be trying to destroy you. I, I, have, I have no doubt on that. But I'm just telling you, whatever is going on in your life, it's hard to preach a message to get one thought across and then somebody's like, well, any storm, it must be the Lord. The Lord does it. No, quit blaming the Lord for the storms that sometimes you create. That's the whole point that I want to make. We keep blaming the Lord. Lord, I don't know why you're not blessing me. What have you done lately? Well, I don't know why it's so hard. How hard is it? Well, you just don't understand. I, sometimes I don't, and I get that. I don't understand. Melissa will go through things, and I don't understand what she goes through. She's like, you just don't understand. You're right. I don't. It. I don't understand that. And she doesn't understand the things that I go through. We get that. But sometimes that storm is what is needed to get you in the right direction. So instead of just blaming the storm, blaming God, blaming everybody else, I just want you to take a look at yourself and say, Father, are you trying to tell me something? Please talk to me now because I know there's something in my life. If I can get it better, I know you're a loving God. You're a merciful God. You didn't destroy Jonah. You caused him some uh, inconvenience, some discomfort. You caused him that. So how many of you have been discomforted lately and blame God for the storm? Mm. Well, that's what I had. That's what I had. So I'm going to end with you. The story actually ends well, despite Jonah's 
continued shortcomings, and he's questioning God. He al always said, well, I just don't get it. He was mad about the, the branch that created the shade. He was mad, mad that it dried up, mad about it. But yet God said, you're mad about that, but the people were dying. You weren't mad about that. So let me, let me equate this story with you in the book of Job, chapter 38. I'm just, gonna <coughs> I'm just going to ask you this question. Who, I needed the owl, who are you to question God? And before you say, I don't question God, let me just, let me stop you right there, okay? Let me stop you right there. Uh, me, as Meatloaf would say, stop right there, down, 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 got no right now. Anyway, that's a good one. That's, that's a good song. Anyway, let me stop you right there, okay? Before you say you don't question God, I will beg to differ. I question God. I guarantee you have or are still doing it, and here's why we should not. You can, quest, you can ask God questions. Let me be very clear. Feel free to ask God questions. Lord, I understand. God, can you explain to me? Father, why? I can get that. But you cannot question his sovereignty, cannot question his power, cannot question his control. You can question why you're going. You can even question him on different things in your life. And this is why I tell you why. Job chapter 38, verse 1. I'm going to read through these. Then the Lord answered Job in a whirlwind, from a whirlwind. He said, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Whew. This is the Lord speaking to Job. The Lord done had it. This, if you read the book of Job, so the first chapter, you know, he went through it all. And then chapter 2, he kind of went through. And then from chapter 2 to 37, him and his three friends have all decided Job didn't want to be born ever again. He's like, wipe the day. I wish I would have been born dead. Uh, or wipe my birthday off the face of the annals of time. And his friends were like, yeah, I don't know what you did. I mean, for 37 chapters. And in verse 38, the Lord had enough. At some point, you know, he just had enough. He said, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Man, when the Lord starts talking, you're like, yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. I'm sorry I questioned you. I didn't mean to. I had a question, but I was wrong, Lord. Just to speak to me. Even if you speak discipline to me, I know you're speaking to me. Verse 3, brace yourself. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? I'm sorry, where were you? But you don't know the troubles I'm going through. You don't know the pain. I'm where were you? The Lord is speaking. Verse 5, who determines its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? Verse 6, what supports its foundation and who laid its cornerstone? Verse 7, as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Verse 8, who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? And it said here and no further. Verse 9, and as I clothed it with, cl as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in its thick darkness... Verse 10, for I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. Verse 11, I said, this far and no further will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. Where were you when all this happened? He asked Job. And Job said, I'm sorry, Lord, I'll never question your authority again. What a lesson. Jonah didn't want to go. He went the opposite way. You can't run from God can't run from God. He has a way of finding you, and he's already arranged something for you to help you. But yeah, we just want to wallow in our self-pity and be like, oh, nobody knows. Why are we questioning the way that the Lord works instead of obeying him through it all? Uh, so here's the end of this that I'm going to give to you. I don't know your life, and I I don't, I mean, sometimes I don't, I don't know everybody. I try to know you, and I try to say, hi, how are you? 
I forgot your name. So don't, if I forget your name, I don't mean to. Or if I call you another name, just say, oh, that's, that's my nickname from him. That's right. So <laughs> that's the way it goes. But I want to tell you this. I don't know you, and I don't know your life. And some of you may have came this morning, and you may be struggling. You may be suffering, and you may be feeling the ills of things that are weighing you down. You may have burdens that's been placed on you. You may, you may have all these things, right? You have, de you have decisions to make. You have burdens that uh, you're bearing. You have uh, people that you're taking care of. You're not feeling the best in yourself, but, yeah, you got to take care of everybody else. And I don't know your life, but I do know this. God is a great, great God. And if you will allow him, he will right the wrongs in your life. Yeah, but you don't understand. I, I was abused. I was neglected. I get it. He is not the God of abuse. He is not the God of neglect. If you've been abused and neglected in your life, he's ready to wrap his arms of love around you and say, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. So I don't know your life. You might be like, well, you just don't know. There's too much pain. There is not too much pain for God to heal. There's not too, you haven't went too far for God to reach down and grab you. In the pit, of uh, the great fish. Now, I'll tell you this. Whales and fish, they don't just always go on the surface. They dive down deep. In the pits of places you didn't even think. Ain't no telling where. It would have been nice to have a GPS tracker on Jonah. Be like, where were you? How far did you go? I don't know. That'd be uh, pretty amazing. The point of all that is no telling what he went through. Three days and three nights. What is it? It's not like the picture show where he's in there, he's sitting there, and he's got like a candle. Be like, ah, oh, yeah, this is cool. No. Can you imagine? The slime, the slime. The whale probably didn't just eat that one time. Probably went back up, water gushing. He's getting everywhere. I mean, all this stuff. Just imagine it. And yet, God arranged. You're telling me that God arranged for a fish to be at the right time when Jonah went out, he safely got him. He didn't eat him. He didn't chomp down and, you know, well, Jonah had had his head not got bit off by the teeth. He would have made it. No, he was alive. He survived. He arranged all of that, spit him out on the beach for him to go preach to Nineveh, but yet he can't move in your situation. I'm just asking you, who do you think you are? I asked myself this, this last two weeks. Who do I think I am that God can't move in the midst of my problems? Father, forgive me because my problems are not big. You're big. I have made my problems bigger than they should be. So I'm just wondering today, as I make this call to you, is there anybody here that would say, I have made my problems bigger than my God, and I refuse to continue down that path. He told me to get up and go, but I went up, got up and went in the opposite direction. I am going to instead go where God has called me to go. I'm just wondering. You're here today, and you think, well, I, I got problems. I understand you got problems. I'm not, not, I'm not, um, negating the fact that you have problems. I get it. I get it. Listen, I, let's, let's make it easy. If, you've, if you have problems you've been dealing with for the past two weeks, you have some problem, you, raise your hand. Look at my hand. Raise your hand if you've got a problem, okay? Now, if you have a problem, you, I guarantee at least 50% of the crowd has raised their hand. The other 50% is uh, too proud or, you know, doesn't want to raise their hand right now. Well, uh, he knows I did the head nod. So 25% of y'all, yeah, I mean, I mean, I want to tell you I got a problem, but yeah. And so I'm telling you, we got problems. It's what we're going to do with that. Amen. Stand with me today. What are we going to do about our problems? Our big, big problems. Big, big problems. 
little bitty powerful God, little bitty, he can't handle us. No, that's not how that goes. God is a great God, amen? He can move in your midst if you allow him. He can do the things that you need him to do if you allow him. Question is, will you let him? So, simple here today. You just have to make that decision to allow him to move in your life. Will you make room for him today? Yeah, but I've got my problems. Get rid of the elephant. Oh, it's easy to get rid of a small problem. Well, that didn't really bother me, but it, it's my pet. This one's my pet. This is the one that I think I need to keep a hold of. Get rid of that nonsense. You're here today, and you've got some issues, and you've got some things. Listen, I, I'm just going to do this. I, I don't need you. You don't need me to pray for you. You don't need, uh, Listen, the Lord tells me what he tells me. Nothing about my hands right here, if I lay them on you, the anointing is not here. The anointing is here. It's in your life. Not here. I touched my own self. I didn't fall down. Okay? The point of that is, is God is the one that's doing something. Now, if he tells you to pray for somebody, then by all means, I need you to pray for somebody. If he wants you to grab a hand and say, hey, I'll be with you, and we will pray for you as much as long as you want. But this is really your decision. This is all you. Where you are right now, in the comfort of that space that you're in right now, if you're going to say, God, I, I, did not, I did not think that I was suffering through these storms, but I am, and I need you to do something. I can't do it on my own. I can't do it where I'm at. We got two things. First of all, we're going to sing this. Just bear with us just for a moment. We'll sing this. And as we do, I want you to have a time of prayer. If you need the altars, they're right here. You can, you can come to the altar. There's a step here. There's front pews here. You can kneel where you're at. Or if you just want to st stand there and say, Lord, this is my time with you. But you've got to have your time. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I told you I didn't know you. But if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, that's your first prayer. Forget this whole big story. If you don't know Jesus, you haven't invited him into your heart, then you come down. I will lead you. I'll help you. I'll get you to where you need to go. The Bible says in uh, Hebrews, uh, Paul said, follow me. No, Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me. I'll take you to him. Don't mimic everything I do, but I'll take you to the Lord for sure. So if you need to pray for somebody, that's one thing. But if it's just you, we're going to take a moment, just a moment. We'll go through this one time. We'll take a moment, and we'll wrap it up. Father, I pray that you will touch the lives here today. Lord, I pray that as we are standing here, Father, that people all over this congregation will raise their hands and say, I surrender to you. I will make room for you. Father, I'm not ashamed. Somebody's beside me. I don't care if I hit them. I'll wave my hand to you, Father, and say that I love you and I need you. The storms in my life try to overtake me, but instead they are molding me. They are shaping me. They are causing me to be stronger. Father, if some need to come down here today, I pray that you will give them the, the, the courage to come down to your altar to pray, to get right with you and to say, Father, I've neglected myself for you. But today, I've made a decision. Today, I will make room in my life to do what you have wanted me to do. Holy God, I pray that you will do a work. Holy, holy Father. God, may you be with us. Holy God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on now.
your life. Hallelujah. And as you go your way, amen, you go your way, you'll find things in your life that you need to, okay? We're going to be here. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray for you. They're going to continue playing, and as they do, if you need prayer, we want you to come up. Uh, love to do that. The rest of you, as you go your way, get in your heart of what God wants you to do this week, amen? Amen. Love the Lord. Love one another.